Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining the Lived Black Experience Project uh, live broadcast. Um, we do this to educate, inform, and enlighten um, on those topics that we sometimes find uh, difficult to have uh, when it comes to talking about um, race, racial issues, racial identity, um, the history of race here in America. Uh, and so we're here today uh, to, to bring uh, one of those somewhat difficult conversations. And I'm very humbled. Uh, this I'm broadcasting today uh, from Beaufort, South Carolina, which is where many uh, of South Carolina uh, enslaved individuals were, were brought to uh, Beaufort, to St. Helena, uh, and and to Hilton Head, South Carolina, and so I'm very humbled as I'm I'm looking out of my room right uh, on on the marshland. Um, also, I'm in the area where Miss Harriet Tubman uh, once roamed uh, this air, area during the Civil War. So we're here this afternoon to have a discussion about um, Roots, the novel written by Mr. Uh, Haley. And we're going to, our presenter is going to take us through a discussion um, that will help us reimagine uh, the middle passage. And then we're going to talk about uh, where we are with um, our relationship with racial identity. And I think this is so very timely because last month was uh, what we call Black History Month, but we reminded everyone that uh, Black history is America's history. And so every day then is Black History Month. And uh, so it's, it's really uh, amazing that we can come back today in March and continue um, talking about the history, Black history here in America. So good afternoon, baby sister Kara, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Good, I'm so happy to see your face and it feels strange because you're you're there in Flagstaff and I'm all the way across the states here in Beaufort, South Carolina. Thank you so much for being here and viewers, thank you for being here and I introduce to you and, or present to you if you're a regular viewer, uh, our in-house, our resident, uh, facilitator, as I like to say, Sister Kara House, and I turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, and welcome, as always, to everyone who's joining us today. Uh, we are going to go ahead and launch right into our presentation. And giving our presentation today is Dr. Tara T. Green. Professor Tara T. Green is the Linda Carlisle Excellence Professor of Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies and Professor and former Director of African American and African Diaspora Studies at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. She is the author of four books, A Fatherless Child, Autobiographical Perspectives of African American Men, winner of the 2011 Outstanding Scholarship in Africana Studies Award, from the National Council for Black Stu uh, Studies, Reimagining the Middle Passage, Black Resistance in Literature, Television, and Song, and two forthcoming books, See Me Naked, Black Woman Defining Pleasure During the Interwar Era, and Love, Activism, and the Respectable Life of Alice Dunbar Nelson. She is also the editor of two books, From the Plantation to the Prison, African-American Confinement Literature and Presenting Oprah Winfrey, her films and African-American literature. 
Moving beyond the classroom, she has received recognition for her work as a mentor and for her service in African-American studies. Dr. Green is also past president of the Langston Hughes Society and co-editor of Mercer University Press's Voices of the African Diaspora series. Welcome, Dr. Green. Thank you so very much for having me. Um, some people may know that I lived in Flagstaff for five years from 2003 until 2008, where I was assistant professor of ethnic studies and English at um, NAU and left as soon as I got tenure. So I'm now at University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Um, special thanks to Deb Harris, my former colleague at NAU, whom I know is retired now, and also to Coral Evans, um, whom I work with as well when I um, was president of the NAACP. So this is a bit of a virtual homecoming for me. I will begin by sharing my slides. Okay, almost there. I'll be sharing some information from my book project, Reimagining the Middle Passage, Black Resistance in Literature, Television, and Song. Dr. Green, we're only able to, we're not seeing your PowerPoint right now. And you're muted. I I'm not sure how the mute happened. You're good. Are you able to see me? Yes, we see okay. you and we hear you. Thank okay, you. That's fine. I'm not going to do anything with the PowerPoint. All right. Um, I'll just start over. In fact, I'll just start at a different place this time. Water is always near me, not simply for drinking or bathing, but as a part of my upbringing. That's how it is for those of us who are reared in coastal areas. Before he retired, my dad was a machinist who made parts for ships. For years, my mother's brothers worked in the shipping industry in New Orleans. When I was younger, my absolute favorite activity was to ride the ferry from the West Bank suburban area of New Orleans into the city, especially on Mardi Gras Day. That the Mississippi River holds the pain of importing enslaved Africans and their descendants into what we now call the United States was not something that I knew as a child. Water has always been near me, but I was unaware of how it had been a part of me. Water's presence in my historical DNA called me to this project. 
but it would take me at least 17 years to complete this book. It began when I lived and taught in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Moving to the mountains of Arizona disrupted my connection to water, but that was also when Hurricane Katrina came. Images of people stranded on the streets in their roofs in the August heat streamed nonstop on local and national news outlets. Viewing them told the story of a city I did not recognize, even though I had been there just a week before. I felt disoriented. Most of my family had left the area. One of my uncles who lives in the third ward of New Orleans, however, had a different experience. Concerned about what would happen to his home if he left, he decided to stay in the city. He nearly drowned in fast moving floodwaters, but was saved by some folks, maybe first responders who came by in a boat. I can still recall the pain in his voice as he told me his survival story, story 12 years later. I hear it now in remnants. I was walking home from a friend's house. It was hot. I heard a woman in a tree screaming to me for help. I turned the corner and hit a wall of water. I couldn't breathe. They pulled me out at night. <clears throat> the mosquitoes ate me alive. I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. I've never fought in a war before like Vietnam, but I imagine what it was like. Several days later, he left the city. I hear him tell his story multiple times. More details sometimes, less other times, but always with an emotion that is both unfamiliar yet familiar. He brings me where I don't want to be. I listen with pain intensity. If he can still tell his story, the word is made flesh. This is not his story. This is not my story. It is ours. Perhaps it was also during my Christian upbringing where baptism was a major part of the experience of being Christian that I really began to think about water as a child and its meaning. During baptism, they would tell us children that we were going down into a watery grave. There was singing and shouting and clapping. Wade in the water. It was for me the most terrifying experience I have had to date as, my own, as I still remember my own baptism. Surely they were trying to kill us. One of my young friends, and we were all about six years old, clung to the preacher like a starfish and wailed at pitches as high as any soprano I ever knew. They dunked her in the water and she came out alive and they said renewed. She had been reborn. When 2005 came and Katrina hit New Orleans and the, in the um, Gulf Coast, it complicated my thinking about water and its relationship to black life. In Flagstaff, Arizona, I would learn that most of my mother's family had left. I had no idea where my father was. The cell phones became inoperable most of the day and his only would ring. I would later learn from my cousin in Mississippi that he had stayed behind and was safe in his apartment. I was relieved that my family was not in the Superdome or floating in the river or lying dead in a street, stretched out on a roof as so many had been, wandering aimlessly on streets. At least I didn't think they were. It would take me then 10 years to write this book. It was not the same book I had envisioned. I had seen too much and knew that I had to explore the connection that water has to African descendants as a symbolic history of trauma. What it has done to us, what it has meant to us. And this was before the 1619 Project came out of the New York Times last year or two years ago now. Two centuries after the last ship, with enslaved persons is known to have sailed to the Americas, 
we are still haunted by forced engagement with the Atlantic, especially the leg of the journey known as the Middle Passage. Stories told by African descendant peoples, and by that I mean people of the African diaspora who are of various nationalities, emerge from memories of the Middle Passage experiences where, according to the Transatlantic Slave Database, 12.5 million Africans are estimated to have been transported against their will from their homeland and dispersed to areas of the Caribbean and the Americas. The Middle Passage is the African diasporic imagination and it has come to represent first a site of suffering where physical atrocities have occurred as much as it has a release from suffering. That is secondly, a freedom through death. Inspired by memories born out of the suffering and oppression, my book expresses my interest in exploring how the legacy of the Middle Passage is represented in the art of African descended people, including how they tell stories. And this comes in the form of the written word. We all know stories. We know them as novels, as poems, as songs. It can be through acting. It can be through dancing. We can imagine that there are many more. I conclude that by engaging in these forms of storytelling, hearers of the word are able to find themselves in memories of the past and to decide what power the stories will have in crafting their own identity as they navigate oppressive forces. And as I speak this evening, I hope that we will think about how the legacy of the Middle Passage is still present today, um, particularly as we move closer to a trial um, of Chauvin, Chauvin, who um, killed George Floyd. If we think about the movements of Black Lives Matter and so on, how are those legacies of this Middle Passage? African descendant artists surmise that in the Middle Passage, Africans were introduced to the ideal that they were Black and that Black had meaning, meaning that was significantly opposed to their identities as members of various ethnic groups and communities. To be Black and no longer African, and of course the specifics regarding African, <clears throat> required submission to white supremacy and to see the self through the eyes of the oppressor who saw black people, people of Africa as valueless barbarians, except when the black body was exploited to make money. However, it stands to reason that African captives facing unbelievable, unexpected, strange and foreign threats would have come to value their lives even more. In this state of understanding, African captives' resistance to this new experience was inevitable. African descendant artists' revisions and reimaginings seek to make legible the untranslatable, the painful, the emotional by isolating and narrating moments in the Middle Passage where the humanity of the African captive clashes with the inhumane acts of white supremacy. Building on this history, sociologist Orlando Patterson would argue that African, that enslaved people, not specifically or exclusively African, um, are socially dead, which means that we have been cut off from our roots and have succumbed to the oppression that we have endured over the years, over the centuries, over the decades. I resist this thinking. I think that we have ample evidence to think about where resistance lies. Instead, I am interested in how African descendants have responded when threatened with forms of death. African-American religious studies scholar Albert Rabatode's definition of conversion provides a lens through which I analyze the role of resistance in the construction of a transformed identity resulting from engagement with the various presence of water. 
Water, I see, acts as a bridge between life and death in their various forms. Death, I argue, is simultaneously a pause in the life cycle, the beginning of a transformed state of life, while social death indicates a life status based on someone's perception, specifically the oppressor's perception. Water as the Atlantic did during the transatlantic slave trade, acted as a symbolic medium or conduit between the captive who is deemed as socially dead and the captive's attempt to reconstruct the self as a converted or transformed person. So just to explain that a little bit further, what I'm saying is, is that the movement over the Atlantic, the enslaved African was not the same person once that person arrived, and I am specifically saying person, once that person arrived in the Caribbean or in the Americas. It is there in that new place, in that new state of being that the African captives came to understand for the first time that they were not considered human by their strange looking captors. Having no previous sense of this, we can imagine that many would have begun to see their lives differently, to embrace what they knew as true, that they were human and wanted to be treated as such. As a fluid space, temporality, time shifts from the past to the present for the very act of moving over the Atlantic as a captive incites a new identity and understanding of freedom. African descendant artists find then that the middle passage and the experiences associated with it have purpose that begs descendants to look beyond the trauma. How do you move behind a history that is so painful? How do artists do that? They do. So I argue that African descendant writers and artists recognize the Middle Passage as a historical and figurative place for discovery. By returning to it, they exercise, they take out, they push away the idea that fueled the transatlantic slave trade in the first place, which was, like, which was that black life does not matter then or now as they express that in fact it does. To be sure it was there in the middle passage that forms of black resistance to social death were born. I am a literary scholar and as a literary scholar, it is clear that black writers have tried to understand the middle passage and the tension between the meaning of water as a site for trauma and for transformation. The earliest of this Earliest example of this is Alada Equiano, who was taken from present day Nigeria when he was a child. Many of you may be familiar with Alada Equiano's account of the Middle Passage. Equiano and his narrative, the interesting narrative of Alada Equiano or Gustavus Fasa, if you haven't read it, you can pull it up online. It was published in 1789. It provides the earliest written memory of the Middle Passage. Through writing, Equiano projects an emotional appeal that stands as a form of resistance to the horrific experience, not only suffered by him as an individual, but also others who endured what became known as the Middle Passage. So he doesn't call it as such as he describes that experience. And just as a side note, there are some who argue that a lot of Equiano actually was born in the U.S. and did not um, was not taken from Africa. I deal with that in the book as well. His talent, among others, as a writer, is his ability to connect the senses. He moves effortlessly from expressing a child's fear to describing why that fear is reasonable. We feel, quote, the closeness of the place and the heat 
of the climate. And then to help readers to understand the feeling of closeness in the hold of the ship. What a horrific experience. He says that each had scarcely room to turn himself. Um, the closest I, I get to that is thinking about an MRI. If anybody's ever been into an MRI or think about what it would be like to wake up in a coffin. Um, this is what he describes. He says the closeness and the lack of fresh air almost suffocated us. We can imagine then that there was a profound sense of claustrophobia as people who did not know each other were forced to share an enclosed space that had no respect for its human inhabitants. Um, they would also be called by scholars human cargo. Equiano moves from touch to the sounds and the smell by noting, quote, the shrieks of the women and the groans of the dying. Equiano issues a call as a writer in 1789 an invitation to walk with him through a painful memory that we still have with us today. Honoring this connection between history and memory, over 200 years later, Black American poet Robert Hayden takes his cue from Equiano and reconstructs a historical moment with his own iconic poem called Middle Passage. And according to poet Brenda Marie Osby, who's, who's um, based in New Orleans and from New Orleans, she says that Hayden's poem nodded to poets that it was time to revisit the Middle Passage. The poem was first published in 1945 and it was republished at some point in the 1960s. Hayden's poem captures particular historical experiences mired in severe oppression at a time in the 20th century when oppression had taken on different forms from the 40s to the 60s and even now. And while that poem may have been lost on an America that was preoccupied with World War II, it resonated among African descendants in the 1960s. The civil rights and black power movements had ushered in an era of black resistance and African independence movements were well underway. So that brings us to Alex Haley. In 1976, at the country's bicentennial, Alex Haley, who had established a reputation as a journalist and a writer of the autobiography of Malcolm X, published Roots, the saga of an American family. His historical novel appeared in the decade after the emergence of the civil rights movement and the black power movements, as well as the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in 1965, of Malcolm X in 1966, and of course of Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968. Additionally, the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act had been signed. <clears throat> in the 1970s, as U.S. racial tensions began to fade from nightly television news, the nation focused on U.S. troops in Vietnam. By the time the Watergate scandal dominated the news, leading to the resignation of President Richard Nixon in 1974, the nation found itself occupied with an unstable presidency as bicentennial plans were underway. In other words, the nation needed a bicentennial and needed a reason to celebrate and to come together to unify. So anticipating the release of Roots, President Gerald Ford appointed Alex Haley to participate in the planning of the bicentennial. In 1977, President Jimmy Carter took office. Yet segments of society were still calling for change. Black people don't forget. That change came out of the black power movement of the 60s and 70s and it remained prominent, particularly when it came to curriculum of um, universities that were still 
sort of leaning towards the idea that if we're going to invest in courses, if we're going to invest in programs, they really should be about white people and certainly not about black people or Native Americans or Latinos or Asians. So emerging from that movement, student protesters demanded that university curriculum include the contributions that the people of Africa and their descendants had made to the development of Western civilization. By the time roots hit the shelves, universities had begun to offer black studies courses and writers and activists such as Sonia Sanchez taught some of those courses. Enter Haley's Roots which told stories of slavery from the perspectives of the enslaved. We just simply did not have it before then. As a historical novel published approximately 200 years after Alada Equiano's narrative that I just referred to, he penned the story where he penned the story of his life in Africa, captivity and freedom in 1789 Haley delved into the psychology of humanity to tell the story of captivity and a journey towards freedom from Africa to the southeastern coast of the United States of America. Alex Haley was fully aware of America's interest in stories told by African Americans about their lives. I've just mentioned that he was a journalist and of course, that he had collaborated with Malcolm X on the writing of the autobiography of Malcolm X, which has sold at record numbers when it debuted in 1966, especially because of the leader's um, death assassination. Writing the story of a revered and feared African-American activist while building a relationship with the man ignited Haley's own black pride as he was exposed to African and African-American history in his conversations with um, Malcolm X, but with others as well as I'll get to. Haley, who had been born in Ithaca, New York, spent much of his childhood in the South, but had moved to New York after retiring from the Coast Guard in 1959 where he pursued his writing career. During his service, he moved from a cook's position to writing public relations pieces for the government organization. So not much about black people there. After building a reputation as an interviewer of various celebrities, mostly African-Americans, he was able to secure his first promising contract with Doubleday for a book on the life of Malcolm X. Following the life of an inquisitive African-American man meant that Haley himself had to engage in parts of African-American history about which he knew very little. Just because you're black doesn't mean you know about the histories of black people. It requires study. So his own mother who had died when Haley was 10 years old had actually shunned talk of slavery and his father was an agricultural professor, so he wasn't very much help. This wasn't his area. So Haley's exposure to studies of Black people by emergent scholar C. Eric Lincoln and Haley's conversations with Malcolm included the minister's travels to Africa during the time when African countries were separating from colonial European rule, gave Haley insight into Black life that drew him back to childhood stories he had heard of ancestors from his grandmother. With help from at least two other writers, researchers, and editors, it would take Haley 12 years to develop and finish the story that came to be known as Roots in America Saga. For Haley, writing Roots, and I, I wanna emphasize it's an American saga, not an African-American saga, was most certainly an exercise in discovery of the self, of Africa, of Black America, and of America. Because Roots was available to read in parts 
Haley marketed the book as a personal journey into the history of his family. In fact, quote, Haley, from one um, scholar, Haley mixed archival research, oral traditions, and fiction into a narrative he described as faction. So maintaining that his journey was emblematic of the lives of any American who had come to North America and, he, and who wanted to connect to their historical past was a way in which he built an audience. But Haley also advanced a spiritual aspect that was uniquely his. Struggling to complete the project while trying to maintain some semblance of financial balance between two divorces, children, and other personal problems. That's another reason why it took him 12 years um, because of his messy personal life. Haley decided to take a transatlantic voyage. His goal as expressed in the chapter's epigraph was in the book's epigraph was to try to get closer to the experience of the man he would name Kunta Kinte. He says, my crossing of course was ludicrous. By any comparison of the ghastly ordeal endured by Kunta Kinte, his companions and all those other millions who lay chained and shackled in terror and their own filth for an average of 80 to 90 days, at the end of which awaited new physical and psychic horrors. But anyway, finally, I wrote of the ocean crossing from the perspective of the human cargo. For Haley, it was on water that he made major turns in his journey towards a black identity that had purpose. His father had expressed disappointment in his eldest son, Haley's lack of professional success and often advised him to pursue a degree, which Haley never did. Stumbling upon a writing career to stave off loneliness and boredom aboard ships that he was on for months prepared him to bring forward a story that spoke of his family, maintained Haley, and that gave voice to those physical and psychic horrors. Delving into those horrors in the 20th century remains relevant in the 21st century. In the 21st century, in the age of President Barack Obama and the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, which has moved over at least two or three generations now, it is worth revisiting roots in its various iterations, the novel and television adaptations. I will only speak briefly about the novel, but there have been two television adaptations, which I do talk about in the book. Since the success of the novel, a TV series captured audiences and regaled the descendants of Africans and Europeans with Kunta Kinte's pursuit of happiness, if you will, despite being abducted from his homeland and sold into slavery. Knowing their, their African ancestry sustains Kunta's descendants through unbearable challenges. Readers know that the ultimate American story is that Haley himself, the descendant of enslaved Africans and European enslavers, reclaimed the narrative of ancestry and weaved a tale that won him a Pulitzer Prize and critical acclaim. But unfortunately, it also earned him a few legal battles. I explore Kunta's story not as a work of fact. That's that's not my um, interest, but as Haley's attempt to use storytelling to create oneself as an act of resistance. And to be very clear, um, once this became a television series, nobody cared to know whether or not um, Alex Haley had actually been able to do the tracking, ancestral tracking of finding um his actual ancestor, which he wasn't able to do actually. Um, but Haley's claim to have located his forefathers placed him at least until his story was refuted by claims of plagiarism and several curious reputable scholars as an authority on the act of reclamation through return. 
So what does it mean to imagine a return to the place of your birth? As a result, Haley's novel was has received little scholarly attention, probably because of um, these debates. And in addition to charges of plagiarism, there are claims that Haley's faction, as he called it, was written not solely by Haley himself, but also with considerable help from others who contributed to the writing and editing. To learn a story, or at least to write one, requires historical, archaeological digging up of the past. And what surfaces is bound to ruffle the consciousness. Attention to Haley's claim of roots as faction, which is a combination, of course, of fiction and facts, came too late and prompted damaging criticisms by reporters and academic scholars. There were attempts to invalidate the reality of slavery and the ongoing implications of the slave trade, which we know actually happened. So for our purposes, I am not focusing on the analysis of the intricate historical details of roots. My concern is with the novel's purpose and indeed the fact that it was his idea. It was inspired by his family's history. He never wavered on that. That he was a sailor and that he wrote most of roots is also not under dispute. And to be sure questions about authenticity, authenticity of authorship aside, Haley's attempt to give voice to the oppressed and not to the oppressor cannot be denied. It is extremely important. So until the moment of his publication, no other fiction writer had dared to climb into the depths of the Middle Passage and to consider what the experience meant to those who had endured it. In doing so, he asked those descendants of the horrible experience those Africans and Europeans, it's not just what we carry, but it's also what the descendants of Europeans carry as well um, as we meet even in the 21st century, that we are asked to remember a historical event that was wedged in the subconscious and lingered at the heart of white supremacy and still does. But just a few years after the bombings, of black churches, race riots in, in major American cities, and during America's celebration of its foundings in the 60s and 70s, Roots offered a counter narrative by, em by emerging and shining a light on slavery and the American's controversial connection to Africa, which had not happened before. It also brought a sense of pride to African descendants who knew too well the legacy of slavery, the loss of names and cultural practices, social discrimination, economic disparity, and so on. Roots telling the, of the story of Kunta Kinte from his birth to Gambia, Africa, to his capture and transport as a slave in Virginia, Haley gave another perspective on slavery and black people. And while Kunta's personal story ends with the loss of his only daughter who was abruptly taken and sold to another owner, its attention to Kunta's descendants ending with Haley suggests that slavery was not an end nor a beginning to black life in America. And at the heart of American history is the Middle Passage as told and remembered by Haley in the voice of Kunta Kinte. Storytelling is powerful. And in that power, we also see how a writer, an African descendant of enslaved people resisted this idea of social death, that there is no connection that is known of the past. For Haley himself, who plays with time and his telling of roots and his retelling of Kunta's story, he signals in his personal Middle Passage story that it is the simultaneous existence of the past and present 
that saved his life and pointed him to the future. And he would continuously write about that. I'm going to move towards an end. So regardless of Kunta's story, whether we think of it as fact, faction, or whatever um, we want to call it, his story remains in the American consciousness. If I say Roots, somebody remembers at least watching the TV series. Um, even if people haven't read the novel or even forgotten that the novel exists. He did not write the TV series. The TV series was in production and um, prior to him actually finishing the novel. So um, he was on set, he did advise, but he was not the writer of the screenplay. From Resistance, through and in quiet and silent times to visual narratives of overt physical resistance, Roots has given voice to a history that is now ingrained in the DNA of America. And as we think about DNA, we know now that if something is written where writers go back, they have Ancestry.com and any other um, kind of, of resource now that he did not have then. So what he did was still bold and it opened up doors for us to think <clears throat> about the meaning of our stories as African descendants. But for anyone, despite its flaws, Haley's work stands as an appropriate and successful attempt to not only reclaim for black people an identity with the people labeled as simply slaves, but also as an example of how African descendants defied social death. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that, Dr. Green. Uh, we are gonna go right into our uh, Q&A. And uh, the first thing I wanna ask about, because you talked about it a little bit, uh, in the midst of your presentation was just uh, towards the end, the difference between the novel roots and then the televised series, which uh, Alex Haley did not write, um, but was on the set of. Um, so the question was how different was the screenplay from the book? Um, well, it gave more attention to some of the characters. And um, if, if I'm remembering the first series correctly, there's a triumphant moment that happens with Chicken George at the end of the series. Um, that doesn't happen in the novel. Chicken George dies rather abruptly by falling into a fire. So um, these moments of celebration, there's, there's certainly moments of agony, but um, there are moments of celebration that are in the TV series that take the edge off. Um, the tragedies that we are more familiar with uh, when reading and talking about slavery that just, you know, they happen in the series and, and, and people don't have to cry every few minutes. Uh, one of the other questions that I think relates to that was whether or not Roots glamorizes slavery or glosses over how horrid it was. Um, so I want to focus on that question, but also then the difference between the screenplay and the, the novel um, in those editions of those triumphant moments and the, the sort of evasion of, of trauma. Um, if you could talk uh, in the midst of uh, talking about whether or not Roots glamorizes or glosses over uh, the atrocities of, of slavery, um, the significance also of that um, that shift in the televised version of it. Um, was that an attempt to, um, uh, or, or did it in ways sort of subvert the powerfulness of the message of the, the novel? Uh, was it an attempt to make the, the um, dramatization of this book more palatable or more comfortable in ways? Um, and who was that comfort meant for? So again, I want to emphasize that the novel, and th this is the case with any sort of adaptation, the difference here being that the novel um, and, 
the schedule of the novel coming out um, is so close to the actual series coming out that they really are two different genres in the term in terms of the stories and in terms of the audience and they still are so i would encourage everyone to actually read the novel and to think about it as a novel so um you know as 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 somebody who studies literature and african american literature i think that what becomes lost is when we talk about um a series or a film and do not do the work to know uh, what its actual relationship is to the um, to the original work. So, um, what I want to emphasize then is that these come out again, as as I've stated earlier, at a particular time in U.S. history. And so, um, you know, I, I wouldn't, I certainly would not use the word glamorize. But people were not having conversations, I'm fairly certain of it. His, his own parents didn't want to have conversations about slavery, and they were Black people. Mm -hmm. So when people began to have conversations about slavery, um, which is what the 1619 Project did as well with, with the New York Times, it forced people to have conversations about slavery. 12 Years a Slave um, got people to talk about slavery. But this was in people's homes. And so it opened up a conversation, a dialogue that would not have been on the table or at the table otherwise. That's the importance of the series. The importance of the novel is to think about a genealogy. And so when I think about the Old Testament, um, and it begins where there's this, this beauty and this creation. That's how Alex Haley actually starts off um, his version of Roots. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really important to think about why it was important to that particular writer to tell such a story and to tell it um, in various ways. Yeah, I, I want to talk about that actually, and and uh, you mentioned the use of black story and black narratives to, uh, or the importance of using them to centralize and elevate the black narrative in America, um, maintain historical memory, and address historical trauma. Um, so I want to ask, how can we relate the highlighting of Roots? Uh, and it's a highlighting that's happened more than once with the 1977 series, the 2016 miniseries, uh, and even the, um, the presence of the, uh, the series based off of Queen. Um, and it continues to be highlighted, I think, even today. Um, so how can we relate the highlighting of roots and the emphasis on the need to incorporate these Black uh, uh, contributions to curriculums and the, uh, the American narrative to today's narrative of the Black lived experience? Well, such works are still being written. So we have work that is written about um, and, and a lot of that has to do with technology also is that people have access to DNA um, and they also have access to records that, that he simply did not have access to. And so we have had, um, I would certainly say over the past 20 years, an emergence of a number of novels written by women and men who reimagine. Um, but even when I think about science fiction, I think about um, Octavia Butler's Kindred. Mm -hmm. She does something very similar. She just imagines, and not just Kindred also, but some of her other work, what it's like to go back to Africa and then to be taken um, into slavery or Kendrick, which is um, this the the character, the woman goes back mm 
and she ends up having to save her ancestor. And so we don't forget. We continue to write. We continue to reimagine. We continue to go back and to process the trauma associated with it, probably because we are here now. And what does being here now mean to us? How do we define ourselves? How do we identify ourselves, particularly in a country that is not always welcoming to us? Mm-hmm. You know, as we think about um, the pu- public murders of African Americans that we now have access to, we didn't have access to that kind of technology in the 70s in the way that we do now. We certainly have photos of lynchings. We had that, but we didn't have video where we could actually see someone's life drain out of them. Um, So it it becomes important to write a human story. Yeah, Uh, we had a question just come in um, asking, is slavery then a part of uh, our DNA uh, as uh, uh, Black Americans is part of the African diaspora um, in how it is part of our historical trauma. Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. I mean, so you can't, you can't, if you take it out of an American story, a Brazilian story, a, um, a, a Haitian story, then it's because, um, you know, that just results in a silencing and a washing out. And so then the pain and the trauma and even the triumphs that come out of, of survival, actual survival, um, then you say, well, you don't have a right to whatever that pain is. And that, well, you're not really traumatized. You're not really dealing with anything. I don't know what that is, which we get anyway. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that the story needs to not be told. Yeah. I want to uh, focus on that, too, a little bit and and that uh, constant seeming call for for uh, blacks to stop dwelling on history and and on the middle passage um, and you talked about the the literary return to the middle passage uh, as a way of pushing against historical trauma um, so you referenced Octavia Butler's kindred I can think of um, uh, the the recent film antebellum um, the older film uh, Sankofa which is a more Africanized uh, return um, to the, the story of, um, or connecting that, that African legacy specifically to the, the narrative of the Middle Passage. So um, I think my question there is really just, um, is that ultimately our response to those calls to stop dwelling on the past? Um, is, is, is the response just the fact that, you know, we can't, and and there's no other place where uh, where folks are similarly called to forget the past. Yeah, well, America can't. So you know, we have Confederate statues. Black people didn't put those up. So you know, we continue to have to have conversations. Some of which have been in, in Arizona. So we've, we continue to have to have conversations to understand where that legacy still resides mm-hmm. in the soil, on the street corner, when we look at signs and, and um, whose name is on that sign in terms of, of the street or the naming of a school or a portrait in a building and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. We can't not have that conversation because the markers are still there. And if the physical markers are there, then that also means that there are social traumas and psychological markers that still exist as well. Yeah. Uh, My final question then is, uh, again, focusing a a bit on what you just shared. And um, it was something that you emphasized earlier in your presentation was the fact that Alex Haley uh, in writing Roots focused it as an American saga not African American saga, uh, and you said that you wanted to emphasize that, and I think we see the same emphasis in in that later novel, Queen, uh, 
uh, that he identifies as the story of an American family, not of an African American family. So if you can tell us more about that, if you will, and, and why is this distinction important? Well, it was important again, going back to the context because he was part of the bicentennial. And of course the focus there was on American history. But I think that he also understood, regardless of its connection to um, the nation and, and to the president of the United States, asking him to be a part of that, um, of, of the celebration of the bicentennial, but that he also understood that to discuss American history, that the pause has to be the contributions and the experience that led to those contributions of there being an African presence um, during that particular time, enslavement, um, that's part of the U.S. Um, soil, part of the, of the U.S. narrative. So if he's at the table, then he really has an obligation to say America, um, that there's a weaving of an African presence for this particular reason during this particular era. So he understood that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for engaging with us in this conversation, for um, centraling just that important work of, of centralizing the um, these narratives and the experience of Black Americans as so essential to the American story, not only our stories, but, but the story as a whole. Uh, I think that's such an important focus and, and a focus that we maintain as part of this series, that we're sharing the lived Black experience, not just because it's important to the Black community, uh, but because it's important to the broader community. And it's telling the story of America in a way that many of, of those in our audience have not heard before. Uh, we have someone in our audience who's just uh, noted uh, at the beginning of your presentation the importance of storytelling and, and working to get a historical narrative out of America and uh, just sharing that we must not forget or actually uh, find out the history. Our history has been whitewashed and we don't even know our history as America. And so that's part of what we are working towards in this series is redefining uh, American history and broadening the definition of American history to include all of those important narratives um, that shape the American story. Um, it is our story. Black history is American history. And, and so we will continue to emphasize that and work towards that goal. I'm going to share a presentation really quickly. Just watching for that to get pulled up. So our next uh, upcoming session is on the story of Delphine Lalaurie, uh, uh, a Southern belle who owns slaves and is considered to be America's first female serial killer. Um, it's going to be a very interesting presentation coming up this Wednesday, March 17th at 6 p.m. Arizona time. Uh, giving that presentation will be Mr. Malik B. Bartholomew. So we continue to encourage you to uh, continue engaging with us and join us for that session coming up. Uh, as always, we want to share that the Live Black Experience is dedicated to fully engaging the community in all aspects of the Live Black Experience and in facilitating community dialogues regarding it that lead to mutual understanding, respect, and reconciliation. We are housed in the historic Murdoch Community Center, which is located on the site of the old Dunbar Elementary School. Dunbar was desegregated almost two years prior to Brown versus the Board of Education, and the school system here was held up by the NAACP nationally as a model for education. By taking a few minutes to complete this survey, you will be helping us to continue to provide the community with relevant and timely programming. So the uh, link to the survey is both on the slide and we'll share it into the chat uh, after this presentation as well.
As always, if you enjoy the programming brought to you by the Murdoch Community Center, we ask you to consider helping us to continue this work with a monetary donation. You can do so by going to the link provided below or uh, scanning the QR code. And we remind you that the Southside Community Association is a nonprofit 501c3 organization. And we thank you in advance for any of uh, those donations that you are able to make to the work that we're doing. Uh, we thank you all as always for joining us for this presentation. We are so grateful um, to the audience that continues to join us week after week uh, for engagement with this conversation. We also want to remind folks that we are partnering currently with Brightside Books uh, here in Flagstaff for a uh, lived black experience reading series. Uh, so during this presentation, we linked to a few of the books that were referenced during the presentation that are available at Brightside. And we uh, want to just remind you that for the book series that we are going to be uh, really starting this month, uh, towards the end of the month with the first focus on the first books that we're talking about collaboratively, uh, you can buy all of the books at Brightside and part of the proceeds for those purchases will come to the Live Black Experience Project and uh, the Murdoch Center. So uh, again, we thank you for engaging with us. We remind you of the importance of your engagement and the importance of learning with us as we uh, carry on these stories, as we engage in the storytelling that has always shaped the American story. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again next time. Until then, we wish you all a wonderful afternoon and thank you for joining us.